皆様、リンク J のライブウェビナーにご参加いただき、ありがとうございます。本日は、リンク j u c サンディエゴジョイントウェビナーシリーズ第7回、ウィス大阪大学国際移行情報センターバイオ組織に対する物理刺激による機能化、セッション3、バイオマテリアル、ナノマテリアルをお送りいたします。私は本日司会を務めます、リンク j の関と申します。本日は画面でお示ししているプログラムに沿って進めてまいります。ご質問はウェビナーの Q&A 機能からお願いいたします。時間の都合上、すべての質問へのお答えができかねる場合がございます。また、本イベントではウェビナーの同時通訳機能、英語字幕をご利用いただけます。なお、ウェビナー中の録音、録画、画面キャプチャーなどはお控えください。それではリンク J、常務理事、曽山と、UC サンディエゴ国際アウトリーチディレクター、我が様よりご挨拶いたします。よろしくお願いいたします。はい、皆さんおはようございます。あのリンク J の曽山でございます。えー、今日はですね、えー、UC サンディエゴ校とリンク J、えー、ジョイントウィナーシリーズにご参加いただいて誠にありがとうございます。あの今ご案内ありましたようにですね、えー、このシリーズ、えー、今日で7回目となります。えー、UC サンディエゴ校のですね、いらっしゃる、えー、世界、えー、有数のですねトップレベルの研究者の方にですねご登壇いただいて、えー、そして日本の国内のですねまた世界有数のですね、えー、研究者の方、えー、にもご登壇いただいて、えー、プレゼンテーションをいただくとともに、えー、ディスカッションをし,していただくというシリーズでございます、えー、今回はですね、えー、UC サンディエゴ校の、えー、カレン・クリストマン先生と大阪大学の酒井真嗣先生、えー、にご登壇をいただいて、えー、培養組織に対する物理刺激による機能化についてについて、えー、プレゼント、えー、ディスカッションをしていただきます、えー、ディスカッションの方はですね、えー、両校のアンドリュー・マカロー先生と木岡正弘先生にモデレーターになっていただくことになっております、えー、先ほど7回目と申し上げたんですが、えー、その中でもですね、えー、大阪大学、えー、さんとはですね、えー、今回でセッション3ということで3回目です、えー、2月5日ですね今年第1回目セッション1、えー、2月10日、えー、セッション2そして今日のセッション3ということで、過去のものに関してもですね、リンク J のホームページに概要出ておりますし、あのそのもの一部に関してはですね、アーカイブ動画がされておりますので、ぜひね、こちらもご覧いただければと思います。それではですね、毎回でございます。大変お世話になっているですね、UC サンディエゴ校、オフィス・オブ・リサーチ・アフェアーズ、インターナショナル・アウトリーチのディレクターでいらっしゃる和賀さんからですね、イントロダクションとモデレーターのご紹介をよろしくお願いいたします。若さんお願いします。はい、相馬さんありがとうございます。日本の皆さんこんにちは。Hello everybody, I'm Miwako Waga, Director of International Reach at UC San Diego.、Uh, this is the third of the joint webinar series with Osaka University、uh, on topics related to、uh, mechano-driven functionalization of engineered tissues. Today's topic is biomaterials and nanomaterials. I'd like to take this opportunity to share some updates about the COVID 19 situation in the US. Currently, about 75% of the faculty, staff, and employed students have been vaccinated at UC San Diego. In person, lecturing will resume in fall 2021. After about 14 months of working from home, some of the faculty and staff will return to campus、uh, starting next month. I am taking care of several cases of Japanese visiting scholars coming to UC San Diego in summer for one to two year a s s i g n m e n t Incoming international students are eligible to be vaccinated with,、um, on campus. So, if you are interested in、um, to conduct、uh, research collaboration with、uh, UC San Diego,、uh, please start considering the opportunity seriously and don't hesitate to contact me. Now, let me introduce the distinguished moderators for today's session Dr. Masahiro Kinoka, Professor of Biotechnology in Graduate, Stud- Graduate School of Engineering. And deputy director of the Global Center for Medical Engineering and Informatics at Osaka University. And Dr. Makalo, Dr. Andrew Makalo, distinguished professor of bioengineering and medicine and director of the Institute of Engineering in Medicine at UC San Diego, 
will be moderating the session. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A function at the bottom and write your questions in English. Now, Kinoka Sensei and uh, Dr. Makalo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Miyako-san. And also, the thank you very much to have the opportunity uh, to get the opportunity for the, this symposium for the link J. Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, I'm uh, Masahiro Kinoka from Osaka University. Uh, today, we have uh, two speakers for the, especially for the bioprinting in the, how say, topics of the mechanical driven functionalization of engineering tissues. So that we are, uh, how say, co-organizer by the, how say, Andrew McCord. Professor Andrew McCord, please. Arigato gozaimasu. Uh, good morning, everyone in Japan. Uh, good afternoon from San Diego. I'm Andrew McCulloch, Director of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine at UC San Diego. Uh, and I want to welcome you to this third joint webinar. A special thanks to Kinaoka Sensei and his colleagues at Osaka University uh, for partnering with us on this uh, webinar series on mechanodriven functionalization of engineered tissues. With as uh, Miwaka Waga mentioned, the topic of biomaterials and nanomaterials. Uh, we have two outstanding speakers. I want to thank, use this opportunity to thank uh, Miwako Waga and uh, Aki Soyama from LinkJ for uh, organizing uh, this and hosting this, this webinar series and uh, for, for all the planning that you've done. Uh, it's my special pleasure to introduce the first of our two speakers today, uh, Professor Karen Chrisman. Professor Chrisman uh, is Professor of Bioengineering at UCSD and Associate Dean for Faculty in the Jacobs School of Engineering, the labs in the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine at UC San Diego. Uh, Professor Chrisman earned her undergraduate degree at Northwestern University, then did her PhD in bioengineering at Berkeley and UC San Francisco, and then a postdoc in polymer chemistry at UCLA before joining our faculty at bioengineering at UC San Diego. As you'll hear, her biomaterials research has been uh, extraordinarily successful and uh, already she has therapeutic nanomaterial biomaterials uh, in clinical trials, in advanced clinical trials. She's been the recipient of numerous awards, too many for me to mention all of them, but they include a prestigious NIH Director's New Innovator Award, the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation Early Career Translational Research Award. Um, a, she's a fellow of the American Heart Association and the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering and a recipient of the Biocom Life Science Catalyst Award, the uh, Tissue Engineering Research uh, Senior Scientist Award, and she's also a fellow of the Biomedical Engineering Society. We're um, very grateful that she can join us today to talk to us about her research on injectable biomaterials for translational regenerative engineering and drug delivery. Karen? Thanks very much, Andrew, for the, the kind uh, invitation. Let me share. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. And um, yeah, it's a I'm happy to, to be here to, for the joint webinar, um, although I do very much look forward to the chance when we get to, to do this in person, hopefully, hopefully next year. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about my lab's work in designing injectable biomaterials for regenerative engineering, uh, as well as uh, drug delivery. So my disclosures, I'm co-founder of two companies. I will talk about the work from uh, Ventrix today. So just first an overview uh, for what my lab works on. So we focus on really for regenerative engineering, regenerative medicine, 
Uh, but instead of focusing on say cell delivery, which one thinks of mostly when they think of regenerative medicine, we really take an engineering approach and focus on using biomaterials to stimulate repair for regenerative engineering, but also drug delivery. And we work with different types of materials that you see listed here. So extracellular matrix derived, um, which I'm gonna talk about a lot today, which you have the most success with. Um, but we also work with synthetic polymers and nanoparticles, and I'll, I'll briefly talk about that at the, the end. And the general focus is that we try to use injectable strategies that can be delivered minimally invasively to treat the heart for myocardial infarction, which is what I'll mostly talk about today. Um, but we also do work on these strategies to treat uh, peripheral artery disease. And then also, and I'll mention that briefly, and then um, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but we also do uh, work with um, a collaborator, Mariana Alperin, who's a urogynecologist in trying to use these same regenerative strategies I'm gonna tell you about today for the heart and the limbs, but for treating skeletal muscle associated with uh, pelvic floor disorders, which I know actually in Japan is a, a big issue. Um, I know about 45% of women in Japan suffer from pelvic floor disorders. So I won't talk about it today, but um, it is something we are quite excited about. Uh, so um, one of our main focuses is on treating myocardial infarction. Um, I think everybody is probably well aware that it's the leading cause of death in, in many parts of the world. Um, in the U.S., we particularly have a big problem with this. Um, so you have, when you have a heart attack, if you survive, two-thirds of people uh, do not make a complete recovery um, and have uh, decreased cardiac function. And right now, there really aren't good therapies to prevent um, or treat what's called this negative left ventricular remodeling process, which is where the heart basically dilates and then can't pump blood uh, effectively anymore. And so um, that leads to, to heart failure. Uh, and so we try to treat uh, or develop biomaterial therapies that can be used to treat acute myocardial infarction all the way to, to end stage heart failure. So when you think about trying to treat a heart attack, um, typically you're you know, treating the left ventricle um, and you think about what people have tried on different injectable regenerative strategies. If you think about what you're injecting into, it looks like some, something like this, which is a very dense collagen scar. And so if you think about injecting cells or other biologics um, uh, like growth factors or some of the newer things like exosomes that are basically trying to you know, recruit endogenous cells, the body's own cells to come into that area, this is what all of those cells see is this abnormal collagen scar, which provides abnormal biochemical cues, but also abnormal physical cues. And so I think it's not too surprising that some of the cell therapies, for example, haven't worked very well because you're injecting these cells into this disease environment. And so we take kind of the opposite approach um, to cell therapy in that we try to uh, recreate uh, the extracellular matrix and provide a new microenvironment, a new template for healing. So after you have a heart attack, not only do your cells in that region die, you also get loss of that normal microenvironment. You get loss of the extracellular matrix. So we try to design strategies to replace that and to create a new template for healing. So um, one of the first technologies that we developed um, in the lab, and then it has really taken off from there, um, is what we call our myocardial matrix hydrogel. It's an injectable hydrogel derived from decellularized pig myocardium. Uh, so what we do just briefly is it's actually quite a simple process. You take pig hearts, you chop them up and stir it in a detergent um, that you can see here, and that removes all of the cellular contents. Uh, and so it effectively decellularizes it. We then lyophilize it and mill it into a fine powder and then use an enzyme pepsin to partially enzymatically digest it. So you go from uh, you know, a solid matrix and now to a liquid matrix that when you inject back into tissue, like you see here, it reassembles back into a porous and fibrous scaffold, very similar to the original extracellular matrix. And if you look at it with uh, SEM, you can see it has a nice nanofibrous architecture, very similar to the original extracellular matrix. So we optimize this whole process to be able to go through a catheter uh, into the heart to enable minimally invasive delivery. So you access the heart um, through your 
insert the catheter into the femoral artery. It's snaked up through the aorta. And then you're actually inside the left ventricle with a needle that you can use to perform multiple injections. And so we optimized our material with things like viscosity to enable this catheter delivery. So we've done a lot of studies over now about the past decade um, that really show by providing this new microenvironment, you really do create a new template for healing. So uh, this new microenvironment allows for cells to come in, endogenous cells to infiltrate. Like other decellularized materials, so many decellularized patches, for example, have been used even in surgeries um, in, in the US, they've been used in millions of patients, particularly for hernia repair surgeries. Um, but a lot of uh, decellularized extracellular matrix materials have been shown to shift immune cells from pro-inflammatory pro to pro-remodeling, and we find that as well with our material. Um, but we do think it does have these unique tissue-specific cues to promote cardiac repair and, and cardiac function. So by creating this new template for healing, we affect multiple pathways that are dysregulated or affected post-myocardial infarction and going into heart failure. Um, so we counteract that death in cardiac muscle by increasing cardiac muscle through two mechanisms. We get decreases in cardiomyocyte apoptosis, so it's pro-survival, um, but we also get increases, um, small but significant increases in cardiomyocyte proliferation. Uh, we also get changes, shifts in cardiac metabolism, increases in blood vessels, and then decreases in, in fibrosis. So really it does create in some sense a, a healing wound inside of the, the infarct. So um, a lot of work that I'm not going to show you led to um, the completion of a phase one clinical trial. So we did it in addition to you know, efficacy results in small and large animal models and a ton of safety studies ensuring biocompatibility and that it wouldn't or wouldn't cause arrhythmias. Um, this led to the this phase one clinical trial. Um, this is uh, what the material looks like commercially. It's the uh, Ventrix calls it Venture Gel. Uh, it comes just as a lyophilized cake. You can add sterile water and then you're ready to inject with that catheter approach that I mentioned. So this trial um, was a small phase one safety trial. So the main goal was safety. So all 15 patients were treated between 60 days and out to three years after their heart attack. And then they were followed up from baseline three and, and six months. And so overall, um, you know, like I said, it's, it was a safety trial. And so the primary goal was to endpoint with safety um, and Ventrogel was well tolerated, which was an exciting result because this ECM hydrogel form had of a, of a decellularized extracellular matrix had only been tested in animals previously. So only decellularized patches, ECM patches had been used in patients, but not this injectable hydrogel form. So we we're pretty encouraged by just the safety results because we think that um, you know, has potential impact allowing us to take this kind of technology into other organs since the, the heart is obviously a very high risk organ. So we were able to establish safety with this type of biomaterial technology in the heart, which was exciting. And then of course, we also did look at safety Safety. Um, since we didn't have a control group, since it was just a small phase one study, we compared baseline to three and six months. Um, but we did see some encouraging efficacy signals like change in six minute walk test, how far they can walk in six minutes, decrease in uh, New York Heart Association heart failure classification, which is basically heart failure symptoms, so improvements of that. And then we found that 80% of patients either maintained or improved the volumes of their heart at six months. So um, if you remember, I mentioned the negative left ventricular modeling process that happens after a heart attack, the heart enlarges. And so we were basically able to either prevent or reverse some of that uh, enlargement. And now Ventrix is um, planning to hopefully initiate a, a phase two trial um, this year. It was a little bit delayed because of COVID, but we're hoping to initiate it later this year. And then um, switching to now to, to peripheral artery disease. So based on the success we found in initially in our animal models with using our cardiac derived gel, we thought that this approach uh, might be very applicable to treating ischemic skeletal muscle. So in the case of peripheral artery disease, which doesn't get as much attention as, as myocardial infarction and heart failure, but really affects a ton of people globally. Um, it's also 
caused by atherosclerosis. So you get um, an, a, a blockage of uh, blood vessels typically affecting uh, the limbs or the legs. And that leads to decreased blood flow um, and also muscle atrophy. And then in the most severe form called critical limb ischemia, this can lead to amputation in, uh, for the US it's over 100,000 people each year um, that have amputation. And right now there are no effective therapies and particularly like stents don't work as well uh, in the legs like they do in the heart. So it's kind of even worse, even worse situation. And so we thought because we had seen increases in blood vessels and we'd see kind of this regenerative response with the extracellular matrix hydrogel in the heart, we thought this could be applied to ischemic skeletal muscle. So we tested this in a rat hind limb ischemia model using a skeletal muscle specific extracellular matrix hydrogel uh, derived from the same process I showed you, but starting with pig muscle, skeletal muscle instead of cardiac muscle. And we injected it into a hind limb ischemia model. Uh, and we found that if you inject uh, just saline, uh, the percent perfusion compared to the healthy limb uh, remains the same, or, plateaus, but you get a significant increase in perfusion uh, down to the foot when you inject the extracellular matrix hydrogel. And we found also that, and this was driven mainly by arteriogenesis versus angiogenesis. And then we also found effects on the muscle. So we were able to prevent the muscle atrophy. So if you look at fiber area, saline atrophies compared to healthy, um, whereas our skeletal muscle hydrogel basically had the same fiber, um, fiber area. And then we found that that's largely driven by effects on stem cells. So we found significant increases in PAC7 positive skeletal muscle uh, stem cells. And interestingly, in a separate study, we found that you only get this increase in PAC7 positive cells uh, when you use a tissue specific material. We've also tried cardiac and lung hydrogels, and we did not see those increases in, in the PAC7 positive cells. So, Hopefully I've shown you, um, you know, that extracellular matrix hydrogels have uh, a lot of potential for um, regenerative medicine applications. You know, I showed you the heart and the, the legs for peripheral artery disease. We're taking the same strategy, as I mentioned, for treating uh, damaged pelvic floor muscles to prevent things like pelvic organ prolapse and to treat urinary incontinence um, just with the material alone. But we have also found that you can improve and increase retention of cells and also increase retention and delivery of other drugs and biologics. So you can use this as a delivery vehicle uh, as well. So based on our experience with uh, clinical translation, um, we really started to appreciate the um, challenges of that uh, catheter-based approach that I mentioned. Uh, so I talked about what's called transendocardial delivery, where you're injecting from the inside, um, from the in the endocardium, but that approach can't be used in, to treat patients acutely because you have a risk of setting off arrhythmias by just poking a needle into the the infarct, um, and particularly within the first thirty days, um, patients can be quite arrhythmogenic, uh, and also there's potential for rupture. So we wanted to see if there was a a uh, way we could redesign the material to be delivered via intracoronary infusion, which can be done with the same catheter they use with an angioplasty balloon. Uh, and that can be done at the time of angioplasty, so at the time of uh, the heart attack. And our idea was that you could infuse a material to go through at the time of an acute myocardial infarction, you have leaky vasculature like the uh, enhanced permeation retention effect that you have in tumors, the EPR effect that's well known in tumors, the same thing happens in an acute myocardial infarction. So our idea was we could infuse material, go through the leaky vasculature and then concentrate in gel and infarct, or at least was our initial goal. And so we developed a new infusible form of the extracellular matrix. Uh, so we actually knew that the full ECM hydrogel was hemocompatible, even though it's derived from extracellular matrix because of that, the processing we do with the enzyme and the low concentration, it actually is hemocompatible. You can inject into the bloodstream without issues, but that, so this is our normal processing in A through D. If you look at D here, you can see 
that's not transparent. So it's not a full solution. It's actually has some, um, some of it's in solution, but some of it's relatively large submicron particles, about 800 nanometers in diameter. And that's too big to go through leaky vasculature. You really need, if you look at the nanoparticle literature, you really need something on the order of 200 nanometers or less. And so um, one of my former students, Marty Spang, who, who's graduated now and is actually living in, in Tokyo working at a, a startup, uh, he uh, fractionated uh, the material to isolate just the more soluble components. And then you can also dry that and then have it just stored ready for injection. And so what he found is when we do a simulated intracoronary infusion in the rat model, um, what happens when we tag the material is we did find it localized directly at exactly at the locations of the infarct. And you can see here it kind of has this, um, it's sort of in these micro regions or we call them kind of micro gels uh, throughout uh, the infarct. But interestingly, when we looked at confocal using looking at these tissues with confocal microscopy, the material didn't actually go through the leaky vasculature. Instead, it appears to coat and or fill in the gaps between the leaky vasculature. So we never found it actually going through the blood vessel. We just found it lining here is a couple of capillaries and inside these leaky gaps. Um, and we've now found actually that this can, can occur in, in other models as well. And so because we saw it in these uh, gaps, we thought this might reduce uh, vascular leakage that's known to occur um, in areas of inflammation like an acute myocardial infarction. So we performed that ECM infusion procedure and then we injected tagged BSA or bovine serum albumin into the tail vein and then look to see how much of the BSA went into the infarct. And we found when you inject ECM versus just injecting saline, you do get a reduction in the BSA that goes into the infarct, showing that we're able to at least partially block some of that vascular leakage that occurs after a myocardial infarction. And then we went on to study cardiac function in the RAP model using MRI. And we looked at in diastolic volume, so end of the, the volume of the heart at end of relaxation, in systolic volume, the volume at, at end of contraction, and then ejection fraction, which is a, a calculation from the volumes as a measure of how much blood is ejected out at each cardiac cycle. And so in blue is our infusible ECM, and you can see almost immediately, so within 24 hours, we got significant decreases in volumes, which is an improvement, trends in ejection fraction, and then that difference was maintained out to five weeks later. So we were able to really create a better baseline for these animals and improvements in, in cardiac function. And we found that this was a result um, of at least so far a couple of mechanisms. One is that we do get decreases in border zone cardiomyocyte apoptosis. So we found it's pro-survival. We also do get increases in, in vascularization. So we do think this is helping with myocardial salvage, but we are continuing to, to more do in part, not only to the kind of anti-inflammatory effects of our material, but also the ability to reduce the, the vascular leakage. And we're continuing to, to study this. Um, we've also moved into pigs, basically, showing where you do infuse it with that uh, balloon catheter they use for angioplasties, and we showed very similar results, that we got decreases in, in volumes and trending increases in, in uh, ejection fraction, and so now um, looking at um, hopefully trying to translate uh, this to patients in um, the somewhat near, near future. So, because we affected that vascular leakage and filled in the gaps of leaky vasculature, um, we thought this might actually be more applicable beyond MI into other diseases or injuries where you have leaky vasculature. So we've now tested it in a variety of models, including with Esther Kwan, who is in, in bioengineering um, here at UC San Diego in a mouse traumatic brain injury model. Um, we've tried it in a pulmonary arterial hypertension model, and then also a systemic inflammation model where we're trying to model actually severe COVID-19 pathology. Um, so we didn't actually use the virus, uh, but we used LPS to just simulate a, a strong systemic inflammatory response. And in all cases, we get localization here. You can see it in the brain, in the lung, and this is just an inflammation panel that we 
so far in the systemic inflammation model, we've seen dampened inflammation in the lungs and in multiple organs. Um, and now we're looking also <coughs> at efficacy in the, these other models. So we think this could have some broad implications for basically lots of different diseases with leaky vasculature. And so for just the last uh, couple minutes, um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit um, still talking about the heart, however, using more drug delivery strategies. So we've had a, a collaboration with Nathan Gianeski for uh, a number of years. He used to be here in San Diego, and now he's at Northwestern University uh, in Illinois. Uh, and so his lab developed these nanoparticles that are derived from block copolymers, that have this peptide sequence that's recognizable by matrix metalloproteinases. So what happens is if you dialyze the, this polymer um, into PBS, you get nanoparticles. You can see here on the right about 20 nanometers in diameter. But when they're exposed to MMPs, this gets cleaved off and destabilizes the nanoparticle. And that leads to these large aggregates. And the idea is that you can inject this material systemically or inject these particles systemically um, just through intravenous infusion. They would go through that leaky vasculature that I already talked about in an acute myocardial infarction. But once they go into the tissue, they see high levels of MMPs that, are, that occur in acute myocardial infarction and they undergo this switch. So they go from nanoparticles to big micron scale aggregates, and that's too big to exit out. And now you have, I like to think of them as like mini drug delivery scaffolds stuck inside the heart that you can ideally, and we've now started to look at also tagging different drugs onto this. But I'll just show you that you do, basically that worked. Um, you do get retention like that. So here you just have H and E stain sections, and then and B and C green is myocardium, black is where the infarct is, and the particles are in red. So when you have non-responsive particles in an infarct, you get barely any retention. Um, in healthy, you get no retention. Two days after um, delivery in an infarct with the responsive particles, you see a lot of particles retained in the infarct. And then even out to a month later, you still see the particles. So now we're looking at conjugating different drugs. Um, and we've seen you still get targeting even with other drugs. And we're looking at um, efficacy of, of delivering different um, drugs in this manner. So in a truly minimally invasive way, but then better targeting to the heart versus just full systemic free drug delivery. Uh, so with that, just to, to quickly summarize, hopefully I, I've shown you how biomaterials I think can play a big role in, in tissue repair as well as drug delivery. Um, so I talked about a couple different technologies. We have our extracellular matrix hydrogels that you can deliver into tissues via direct injection or catheter-based, needle-based injections. We have our new infusible ECM that enables intravascular infusion that I think of it more as treating our healing tissues from the inside out. And then finally, um, our nanoparticle technology to enable IV delivery um, for or IV drug delivery more targeted uh, to the heart. And so with that, I'd like to thank all the, the great people in my lab, both current and former, um, especially uh, also my collaborators. I work with a lot of great physicians uh, that really have enabled us to, to translate one material. And we're hoping to actually the peripheral artery disease one we're going to submit to the FDA, uh, the skeletal muscle extracellular matrix hydro we're going to submit to the FDA later this year. So um, definitely owe a lot of gratitude to my clinical collaborators and then also thank the, the funding sources. So thank you very much. And then, yeah, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Karen, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, while I wait for some of the questions in the question and answer, um, I have one uh, of my own, which is, um, have you tried since the uh, perfusable uh, biomaterial localizes to the vasculature, have you tried using vascular extracellular matrix to derive the material? We, ha we have not yet. We have tried lung extracellular matrix for more the COVID project where we're trying to treat lung inflammation. Um, the lung doesn't seem to work as well as the cardiac, interestingly. But no, we have not tried the vascular derived ECM yet, but I think we should. So it's a good, yeah, very good point. We have a couple of questions in the 
Q&A uh, from Shinji Taguchi asks, it's interesting to know that the injection of ECM allows the cardiac myocytes to recover, but do all types of heart infarction suffer degeneration of the ECM? Uh, it could be some sort of heart disease that this type of matrix remodeling is not relevant. I mean, I guess the interesting thing here is that most cardiac disease remodeling is actually fibrotic, yet um, the it's also associated with uh, matrix degradation and that that process seems to be the one that's promoting, you know, what Erky was allowed to call anoecus, which is apoptosis due to dissociation from the matrix. Is that mm -hmm. your theory? Yeah, I do think so. Obviously, in the infarct, you have a very localized region of this happening, but right, other like non ischemic heart failure, you still get it's more distributed, but you still get fibrosis and abnormal extracellular matrix. So, um, I do think, and many of the same pathways we affect in ischemic myocardium also occur in non-ischemic heart failure. So I do think that this would be applicable to, to other heart failures. And I actually do have a, a grant also with Mike Davis at Emory where we're looking at this for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So for right ventricular failure um, in pediatric cardiac um, defects, I don't have data yet to say if it works in that case, but um, we're gonna try to find out. Yes, that's a very uh, severe um, congenital heart lesion. There's one more question asked about the size of the needle used for injection. Um, can it be small or? Yeah, um, so we, in the animal models, we use either 27 or 30 gauge. So you can inject it through quite a, quite a small needle. The third question is Japanese. So I'm going to have to ask Masa <laughs> to, uh, to read that one. And then I can use this opportunity to hand over to him to then uh, uh, introduce uh, Shinji. Masa, can you see the Q&A? Okay, so the... Mm. Or perhaps the question, yeah, okay. Question is, want to understand the, how the disorder of the function for the uh, PDF. So the, which kind of the disorder and the disease is uh, you can apply, and also the he want to know the uh, efficacy of this one. Can you understand my meaning? So, so, I, so, I, what kind of conditions for for which which yeah. type of material? Uh, there are no information, but uh, how say for your injectable how say for example, uh, you apply the how say cardiac. So the similar how say materials we want to consider. You, you, yeah, I think so. If I understand the question, you can uh, you can make this material from almost any tissue you want. Um, I would say, with the exception, you can make it from brain, but that's hard. Um, all other tissues you can make. So, I think anywhere where you have you know dysregulated matrix and you need to kind of stimulate like a healing wound response you could theoretically use this for, um, although it's likely to work, you know, better in some indications versus, versus other. But I, I do think the general concept can be expanded for a lot of other uh, applications. Well, thank you again, Karen, for a, a fabulous uh, lecture. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll transition now to um, the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we want to move the next uh, presentation. So the next presenter is uh, Shinji Sakai from Osaka University. He was graduate from the Kyushu University, Department of the uh, Chemical Engineering. And uh, after becoming the associate professor in the Kyushu University, he moved to the House of Osaka University as a professor in the Department of the Chemical Engineering. Now, uh, today's his topic is, uh, sorry, uh, tissue engineering based on the enzymatic cross-linking and the degradation. Okay, if the Shinji Sensei can start, please start. Okay, thank you, Kinoka Sensei. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so thank you, Kinoaka Sensei, for your kind introduction. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to make my talk in this webinar. So thank you for organizing. So today's my talk is uh, in, as introduced by Kinoaka Sensei. Today's my title is Tissue Engineering based on uh, sorry. Tissue Engineering based on Enzymatic Crosslinking and Degradation. So this is outline of today's my talk. So please see the middle part of this slide. So in this talk, I will introduce three recent uh, research topics. The first one, first topic is the tissue fabrication by combining cell enclosing microcapsules and cell enclosing microfibers. And for fabrication of microcapsules and microfibers, we are using enzymatic reactions. And the second topic is bioprinting I guess you know the words of 3D printing and bioprinting. Now, bioprinting is a hot topic in the field of tissue engineering, and we are using enzymatic reactions for this bioprinting too. And the third topic is a, it is a brief introduction of a collaboration project for genome editing with Professor Suzuki. He's also a professor at Osaka University, and he's an expert of genome editing. So uh, firstly, I will explain briefly about tissue engineering and enzymatic reactions. Then I will explain about enzymatic hydrogenation and enzymatic degradation. So as mentioned in the title of this presentation, I set the phrase of enzymatic reaction as a key word of this presentation. So this is a very, very famous uh, drawing indicating the concept of tissue engineering. As shown in this drawing, tissue engineering aims to construct bioartificial tissues in vitro and in vivo uh, by combining the suitable cells and by compatible scaffold materials. So the mouse in this photo is also very famous as an icon of tissue engineering. As you find on the back of the naked mouse, this mouse has the construct with a shape like human ear. The ear on the back was prepared by combining chondrocyte and porous polylactic acid, but of course did not have any function. So we are using enzymatic reactions for getting the biocompatible scaffold for tissue engineering. So to help you understand my work next, I will explain about enzymes. So what is enzyme? As shown here, these are biocatalyzed and macromolecules, and of course they are protein, and these do not affect the nature of final product. This is important point, and many enzymes initiate the biological reactions. And also enzymes are produced by the living cells only. So the important point of the enzyme for our research is enzymes can function under mild condition for mammalian cells. So in our study of tissue engineering, we are using two types of enzymes. So one is the enzyme which catalyzes cross-linking of polymers, and another is the enzyme which catalyzes the hydrogenation uh, degradation of polymers. So we started the tissue engineering using enzymes about 15 years ago. As you can realize from these review articles recently reported by several groups, Enzyme mediated hydrogenation is attractive, attracting increasing attention in biomedical field, including, including tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. So, in our work, we are mainly using horse radish peroxide S. As you can realize from the name, the enzyme, this enzyme is extracted from horse radish. As shown in this figure, this enzyme catalyzes the cross linking of phenolic hydroxy group in the presence of hyd hydrogen peroxide. So this is a movie showing the hydrogenation catalyzed by horse radish peroxide S. In this movie, a derivative of arginate containing phenolic hydroxy group is used as a polymer of aqueous solution. So please wait and please see this movie. So this is a solution containing arginate derivative. And I add it again, the same solution. 
Next, I added fourth largest power oxide is HRP. And then I added hydrogen power oxide. And as you can see, in this case, the hydrogen formed within five seconds, just five seconds after the addition of hydrogen power oxide. And these, these graphs show the hydrogenation speed can be controlled by changing the concentration of enzyme and hydrogen power oxide, and of course the temperature. So for example, we can get the hydrogen in short time by increasing the host largest power oxide concentration and by decreasing the hydrogen power oxide concentration. So hydrogen power oxide is a substrate of this reaction as shown here. Thus, this result may seem to be strange from the viewpoint of the usual chemical reaction speed. Of course, there is an optimal concentration, but in the range of this concentration shown here, the increased hydrogen power oxide induces the uh, deactivation of host radish power oxide S. So we think uh, we got this kind of uh, data. An attractive point of this enzymatic reaction is that now there are a variety of derivative of biocompatible polymers which, can, which we can use for this hydrogenation system. So these are the materials developed by our group. And now we are developing the new material with French group now. And furthermore, this is a table contained in the review article published in 2018. As you can see, variety of materials have been developed for this hydrogenation system and used for many biomedical applications. And the existence of the variety of material cross-linkable through the enzymatic reaction means that we can design hydrogels with variety of uh, characters, variety of uh, characters. Uh, and it means we can design the hydrogel for individual applications. So in tissue engineering application, the property uh, required for hydrogels are different in each application. For example, gelatin, gelatin-based hydrogel are effective for enhancement of proliferation and growth of variety of adherent cells such as fibroblast. However, it is also known that chondrocyte, they differentiate when they cultured on the gelatin-based hydrogel. So, and each polymer has unique characters and functions. Therefore, the existence of variety of materials is an attractive point of this hydrogen system. So in the tissue engineering work, as I said, we are using enzymatic degradation. For this purpose, the materials from natural resources are useful because in general, degrading enzymes exist for each natural polymers in nature. So by using these enzymes, we can degrade each hydrogel at, at the preferred time point, even in the existence of living cells. So from here, I will explain about our works using enzymes. The first topic is a fabrication of tissues uh, with perfusible broad vessel-like network by uh, combining cell-enclosing microcapsules and cell-enclosing microfibers. So in the field of tissue engineering, a well-known obstacle of fabrication of large tissues and organs is the difficulty of the development of vascular-like structure, including small capillaries. So it is known that the cells at the center part of spherical tissues cannot survive due to the lack of oxygen when the diameter of the spherical tissues exceed around 0.5 millimeter, it just around, around 0.5 millimeter, less than one millimeter. Thus, the development of vascular-like structure as a lifeline of cell is important for the development of large tissues and organs. In our study, we are trying to develop the tissues containing vascular-like structure by combining cell-enclosing microcapsules and cell-enclosing microfibers. The microcapsules, are used for giving the space for the cellular growth. And the microfibers are used as a template of a vascular-like structure. So this is a scheme for getting the tissues include, including vascular-like structure 
and capillary network. So first, cell enclosing microcapsules and fibers are produced through enzymatic hydrogenation and degradation. Then the surface of the construct are modified through enzymatic cross-linking for the formation of cell layer. Subsequently, the construct are embedded in collagen gel and induced the formation of capillary network by adding angiogenic factors. Finally, the hydrogel fibers and the microcapsules are degraded for flowing medium by pumping. So this is a scheme for getting cell enclosing microcapsules through enzymatic reactions. So briefly, cell enclosing hydrogel particles are obtained through host radish peroxidase catalyzed hydrogenation. Then the microparticles are coated with additional hydrogel membrane. The important point is the polymer for the inner particle and the membrane are different. So the inner particle can be degraded using appropriate enzyme for giving the space for cellular growth. So this slide shows the method for producing cell enclosing microparticles through enzymatic hydrogenation. As you can see, we flow cell containing polymer solution having phenolic hydroxyl group from the inner tube of a coaxial device and also flow a liquid paraffin containing small amount of hydrogen peroxide. So typically as shown in this graph, the diameter of particle decreased with increasing the flow rate of surrounding liquid paraffin in the range between 200 to 15 micrometers. In this system, hydrogen peroxide necessary for the uh, enzyme catalyzed uh, hydrogenation is supplied from the surrounding liquid, liquid paraffin phase. And this is a photo of the resultant microparticles enclosing mammalian cells. So in this case, the viability of the enclosed uh, cells was more than 90%. So by repeating the same process, but using the polymer solution containing the cell enclosing microparticles, we can coat the cell enclosing microparticle with additional hydrogen layer. So this photo shows the behavior of the human liver cancer cells, Hep G2 cells, enclosed in carboxymethyl cellulose-based microparticles coated with arginate-based membrane. So by soaking in medium containing cellulase, it is a degrad degradation enzyme for cellulose, the inner carboxymethyl cellulose-based microparticles are degraded and formed for core microcapsules. And the cells in the hollow core microcapsules grew faster than in the microparticle without, without degraded core. And after around one month of culture, the Hep G2 cells form spherical tissue in the microcapsules. And cell enclosing hydrogen fibers can be prepared using the similar method with those for the cell enclosing microcapsules production. The different point is that the use of aqueous solution as a surrounding liquid phase. And by using the aqueous solution containing both hydrogen peroxide and uh, the polymer derivative crossing coverage through the enzymatic reaction, we can get the hydrogen fiber having the uh, coated with different polymers. So in our study, we used the solution containing hydrogen peroxide and gelatin derivative possessing phenolic hydroxy groups crossing coverage through the enzymatic reaction. And as a result, uh, we can get this kind of the structure. Uh, in this case, uh, the cells are enclosed in arginate-based hydrogel fiber, and the surface of this hydrogel fiber are coated with gelatin layer. So as a result, we can coat the surface of the hydrogel fiber with another cell layer. And in the next step, the cell enclosing microcapsules and the fiber are embedded in collagen gel and spontaneous formation of capillaries are induced by culturing in the medium containing angiogenic factors. The capillaries are around 10 micrometer in diameter and the complex geometry 
Therefore, it is difficult to prepare the vascular network, including capillary network, using the hydrogel fiber as a template. I think a possible approach is using the capillary formation ability of end serial cells. As a final step, the hydrogel tube, hydrogel fiber, and microcapsule membrane are degraded using enzymes. In this study, we degraded them using arginate lyase because the microcapsule and microfibers are obtained from arginate derivative. So these are the photo at one and five days of culture of microparticles and fibers covered with human umbilical vein and serial cells, cubic cells, embedded in collagen gel in medium containing these angiogenic, angiogenic factors. <clears throat> and the star in the photo indicates the microparticles. And as you can see on the fifth days of culture, the end serial cells, uh, they initially existed on the surface of microparticles, microcapsules, spontaneously formed lumen-like structure shown as a star, indicating the star. <clears throat> And some of the lumen-like structure seems to be connected. So after degrading the microparticle, microcapsule membrane and hydrogel fiber composed of arginate derivative using arginate lyase, we flowed culture medium containing fluorescence uh, microparticles of around two micrometer in diameter. We flow the medium from uh, left side and as you can see, the medium containing the small particles flowed here. And you can also find the uh, traveling of the microparticles around the spherical tissues. This photo shows the endothelial cells. Uh, this photo shows that the endothelial cells on the surface of microcapsules and microfibers are essential for the capillary network formation. So please see this photo. Upper side is uh, in the case that we used the microcapsule and fibers covered with endothelial cells. And the uh, lower photo, uh, in the case we <clears throat> used the microcapsules and fibers, they did not cover with endothelial cells. Only the construct prepared by embedding the microcapsules and microfibers covered with endothelial cells had the perfusable vascular like structure, including perfusable of the capillary network. <laughs> okay, so I want to change my topic. So next topic is bioprinting based on the host largest power space cross-linking. So bioprinting is a technique of 3D printing of cell-laden construct uh, based on pre-programmed digital blueprint. So while bioprinting is still in an early stage of development, cell laden constructs obtained using this technology are expected to be important for use as in vitro model for drug screening and tissue engineering, for tissue transplantation and regenerative medicine. And for an advancement of bioprinting, the advancement of bioink and advancement of 3D printing system are necessary. And as mentioned in the previous slide, we developed and we are developing the material cross linkable through host radish HRP catalyzed reaction. So our idea is the use of the materials as inks for bioprinting. So when preparing three different uh, three dimensional tissues and organs, the required property for the inks are different at each part. Therefore, the existence of variety of material Cross-linkable through the same enzymatic reaction is useful when developing the ink cartridges with filled with polymer solutions. <laughs> so one of the original bioprinting system we developed is inkjet-based system. In this system, two different inks are dropped to the same place using an inkjet printer. And one ink contains host radish peroxide S and polymer possessing phenolic hydroxy group, and another ink containing hydrogen peroxide and polymer possessing uh, phenolic hydroxy group, cross-link through the same enzymatic reaction. And by dropping these inks to the same point, 
the enzymatic hydrogenation happens. So in this movie, 500 drops, droplets were ejected per second from each inkjet head. <clears throat> and we could get three-dimensional hydrogen construct as shown here. And this fluorescence uh, photo shows the construct is an accumulation of small hydrogen particles. This means the hydrogenation during this printing process is so fast. And we could get this kind of three-dimensional construct using this system. In this movie, two inks are used at the same time. And now we are developing the system of using more inks at the same time. We checked the viability of enclosed cells for uh, checking the cytocompatibility of the system. And the viability of the cells enclosed in the resultant hydrogen construct was more than 90%. <clears throat> and also, the cells enclosed in the hydrogen construct uh, composed of the hyaluronic acid and gelatin elongated uh, after overnight of culture. This result shows the cytocompatibility of this uh, printing system. And this movie shows the beating hydrogen construct. In this case, a rat heart cells were included in the printed hydrogen construct. This maybe is, uh, was provided by Professor Nakamura. He's a professor of Toyama University. I think it would, it would be possible to print a mini heart with beating function if we can print more complex structure using this system. So by using this inkjet-based printing system, it is possible to do additional printing on the surface of the uh, resultant hydrogen construct. This left shows the printing of line pattern and the right photo show the printing of the cell adhesive area by using gelatin-based ink. The next uh, original bioprinting process is the extrusion-based printing in which the solution containing host radish peroxide ACE and polymer and cells is used as ink. Extrusion-based system is the most popular system in bioprinting. So for inducing the hydrogenation <clears throat> catalyzed by host radish peroxide ACE, uh, you may think that the solution containing host radish peroxide ACE, polymer, and cells uh, should be filled in the syringe after mixing with hydrogen peroxide. However, it is not good for 3D printing because the hydrogenation will happen in this syringe. Of course, it may be possible to prepare a very small construct which can prepare within seconds, but it is impossible to prepare a large construct uh, because, the, as I said, the hydrogel will form in this syringe. So for realizing the bioprinting using the extrusion-based printing system, we developed the system of supplying hydrogen peroxide from gas phase. By using this system, we could successfully print it variety of 3D constructs such as lattice shape, uh, disc shape, and dome shape, <clears throat> and also the ear-shaped construct. And we determined the effect of printing process and the ink on the behavior of mass fibroblast cells. The upper photos are the cell-laden hydrogel, hydrogel composed of the derivative of, of hyaluronic acid alone. And the lower photos are the cell-laden hydrogel composed of a derivative of hyaluronic acid and gelatin. In both hydrogel, the viability of the enclosed cell were more than 90% after three days of printing. So this means this printing process is also cytocompatible. But the behavior of the enclosed cells are completely different as shown here. The cells in the hyaluronic acid-based hydrogel showed round shape after three days of culture. But those in the hydrogel containing both hyaluronic acid and gelatin elongated. So this difference demonstrates the possibility of controlling the behavior of enclosed cells by changes, changing the composition of polymer in inks. And due to the shortage of the presentation time in next, uh, uh, I will explain briefly for the next topic of the genome editing. So now we cannot uh, open the detail due to the patent issues, but 
Uh, in this collaboration project, my teams are developing the material for in vitro and in vivo delivery of genome editing tools. And the collaborator, Professor Suzuki, he's, he developed the homology independent targeted insertion method. It's uh, developing the genome editing tools suitable for our polymer based material. So Professor Suzuki is now a professor at Osaka University, but he spent seven years at Salk Institute. And he said that if you want to know about his research, uh, please contact him freely. And you can find his email address by typing his name, Suzuki and Salk Institute and Osaka University in Google, I think. So uh, this is a summary of my presentation. I want to say enzymatic cross-linking and degradation have a great potential as a tool for a bio biofabrication of functional, functional tissues. And this is the acknowledgement. I greatly thanks for the JST and the JSPS for the financial support, for the financial support of our research. And uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Shinji Sensei. So the how say we already have a okay. We already have a question. So before starting the how say Q and a, I want to how say say the you mentioned the some how say but material design and later you show the uh, some kind of the structural design. So yes. the, the both are important. You want to say so the from the how say uh, audience one question come for the materials. Of course, you use a uh, host radish uh, peroxidase reaction system. So the after digestion of the phenolic kind of the acid phenolic uh, group. So do you have, did you uh, do you have uh, any experiences for the toxicity? Uh, yes, we have checked the site tox uh, biocompatibility by implanting in the mouse. But now we uh, have not found any uh, bad effect. And because we think now we introduce the phenolic hydrolytic group to the polymer, but usually uh, our protein containing the tyrosine, tyrosine containing the same uh, phenolic hydrolytic group. So I think basically the resultant material, resultant uh, component uh, containing phenol is not so toxic. Mm. And also the so that this technique is mainly from the food engineering. So now uh -huh. you want to apply to the medical engineering. At the time, we also have to consider the not only toxicity, but also the uh, immunoreaction. So mm -hmm. other how say audience mentions, uh, how about the immunoreaction? Mm -hmm. I think one risk of the using this enzymatic reaction is uh, currently we are using horseradish path oxide ACE. So it is uh, obtained from horseradish. So I think for the clinical applications, I think we should uh, consider the use of other peroxide S, which we can find from our body. So that to prepare the some how say to uh, uh, to design the structure uh, structure for the tissue engineering. So how about the regulation of the enzyme reaction? So the once after putting the, the peroxide, uh, peroxide days, so after that, so how long the activity keep? So the, can you regulate the how say active or not un inactive? Uh, sorry, now uh, I do not have any information and I cannot say anything for this uh, question. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. And also the, I also have a, a house say question for you. So the for the capillary formation by mm -hmm. using the, your materials, mm -hmm. and after setting the bigger structure using the, your technique. So how do you think the reassembly uh, by uh, as reassembly of the structure? by the cell, uh, sorry, digestion of the materials by the cells, such as the MMPs or something like this, uh, and also the cell want to migrate. Mm -hmm. So the, how do you think the ratio, uh, ratio between 
uh, artificial design and the natural art, sorry, artificial reassembly and the natural reassembly, uh, sorry, uh, engineering artificial assembly and the re, uh, natural reassembly. How about the influence between? Can you image? Sorry. Uh, uh, because you try to prepare the strict structure first as an mm -hmm. uh, artificial design, mm -hmm. but uh, naturally cells start to have uh, some reaction mm -hmm. to change the uh, position. So how about the impact of the reassembly? Oh, mm. so for this point, I think uh, our tissues should be the, uh, I think the initial point. And uh, after the fabrication of the initial uh, point, the cells, I, I think the cell uh, will uh, develop the matured tissues, such as by proliferation and by formation of the additional vascular-like structure. But the important point is the uh, main uh, perfusable network is necessary for supporting the growth and the maturation of such cells, I think. OK, I understand. So that means that you want to mention this technique to apply the initial condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, the neutral way, I mean, the, how say, maturing or neutral way, uh, can make the good reassembly by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. So on the audience, do you have any other question? OK. OK, thank you very much for your talk. Very nice. OK, mm -hmm. so the, we want to move the next. So the Andrew Sensei and I have the, some, how say, discussion point with the other, uh, with the presenters. Andrew Sensei, do you have any discussion point today? Um. No, I, maybe I would ask uh, both of the speakers to um, tell us about what they think might be, you know, new uh, opportunities for the therapeutic targets of uh, novel uh, biomaterials. Um, you know, I think for a long time um, there were kind of well-established targets for biomaterial development, but I think what we've heard today is just there could be a lot more um coming in the future i wonder if there were any comments from either speaker on that i think from our perspective the being able to treat through the vasculature opens up a lot of new possibilities that previously i know i hadn't thought about i think most people always think about how can you implant or inject but if you can go through the vasculature i think and target like disease vasculature i think that opens up a lot of new possibilities so from my lab side that's personally where we're kind of pretty excited about going expanding into into those areas and i, I mean i think we also know that the um microvasculature now is a very sort of tissue specific so each microvasculature has sort of its own zip code and so um you know the possibility of not only targeting the vasculature itself um or using it to deliver to tissues um materials to tissues, but the different targeting specific vasculatures could be very uh, uh, exciting. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of potential new directions or even synthetic strategies to potentially mimic what we're doing with the natural one once we understand a bit more how it's targeting. Thank you. Do you have any other comment for this one? So may I ask one strange question to Prisma? So do sure. you have any other idea? And also, please go ahead. So my strange question is, uh, you injected the uh, ECM from the first person heart to the heart. So my question is, what will happen if you injected the ECM from the liver to the heart? So we, we've done that kind of study in skeletal muscle. Um, we haven't done in the heart, but in general, you can get kind of a generic healing response with, I think, 
most extracellular matrix hydrogels, but we found you kind of get like the maximal regenerative response when you match the, the tissue. So in the peripheral artery disease, the hind limb ischemia model, we have tested other non-tissue specific materials and we got increases in blood perfusion, mm -hmm. but we didn't get the changes in like muscle atrophy and remodeling for example. So I think you can simulate some, um, but to get maximum benefit, ideally you want kind of tissue specificity. Okay, thank you. Do you know um, if there are potentially therapeutic differences between different matrices as a function of age of the donor? You know, kind of like with uh, plasma and parabiosis? Yeah, so we have not done that, but um, Lauren Black's lab at, at Tufts, he's a, a biomedical engineer, his lab has looked at uh, neonatal or fetal, neonatal and adult rats. So his grad students painstakingly took little hearts from rat fetuses and, and made material out of them and did find it induced more proliferation, the younger the matrix. And there's an, uh, other labs, um, I'm blanking on the name right now, though, have also tried this like from zebrafish. Um, so I don't think it's like a translatable material, but uh, as a very regenerative organism, they found that you also get increases in proliferation with doing that. Um, we, we wanted to look at young material. Um, we kind of gave up because from a translational standpoint, you can't generate big batches from like neonatal pig hearts it's just too small so but yeah i think if you could you could get even bigger effects i think there's also um sort of many more lessons in store using these kind of uh, novel approaches that we can learn about cell matrix this basic science of cell matrix interactions my um my former phd student stuart campbell now at yale did an interesting experiment in a um, genetic uh, model of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, actually I think it was a dilated cardiomyopathy that had, had impaired uh, contractile function, specifically associated with mutation in a, a myocyte gene. What they do is they use, they took um, uh, IPS cells from patients with this, with this uh, cardiomyopathy, and they um, grew it in extracellular, uh, reconstituted it in extracellular matrix scaffolds. Um, they were able to find the different extracellular matrices, so extracellular matrix from diseased hearts versus um, the healthy hearts, the, ex the healthy extracellular matrix actually caused a, caused a restoration of function in um, IPS cells derived from patients with- um, Yeah, I saw that, That's a, it was a nice disease. study. Um, so, uh, and I think it just goes to show that um, even, even in these much more specific disease conditions, the role of cell matrix interaction can really never be ignored. Mm -hmm. Master, do you have any final yeah. remarks for us? Uh, at the moment, I don't have. Well, in that case, um, if there are uh, no further questions and discussion, um, I would like to thank uh, both of our speakers tremendously. Um, I'd like to thank the Office of Research Affairs at UC San Diego and Link J uh, and our colleagues at Osaka University. Um, and uh, hand back to um, Miwako for her closing remarks. Thank you very much for the excellent presentations and interesting discussion. I hope you all enjoy the presentations. UC San Diego and Osaka University will continue to promote collaborations in tissue engineering, uh, biofabrication, biomaterials, and mechanobiology. And there should be opportunities in the future to present the progress of a collaboration. And uh, with this, I'd like to sincerely thank all the speakers, moderators, translators, and the uh, LinkJ uh, personnel, and close my remarks. 
Thank you very, very much to everybody. And I hand over the mic to Soyam san. はい、えー、皆さんいかがでしたかあの素晴らしいプレゼンテーション、本当ありがとうございました。あの治療法がまだ確立されていないせ、えー、ような、えー、世界へのですね世界の最先端の取り組みをですねご紹介いただいて、未来は明るいなというふうに本当に思いました。あの今後もですね UC サンディエゴの最先端のですね、えー、研究者の皆様とですね日本の有数の大学の最先端の研究者の皆様とですね、えー、このような形でですねウェビナーシリーズを、えー、続けていきたいと思いますので、何卒よろしくお願いします。お願いします。今日ご登壇の、えー、先生方、そして和賀さん、本当にありがとうございました。じゃあ司会の、えー、関さんの方に戻します。はい、皆様ありがとうございました。皆様いかがでしたでしょうか。6月10日にはリンク JUC サンディエゴ特別ウェビナーカリフォルニア大学創薬コンソーシアム UCDDC のご紹介、その使命と産学連携についてを開催いたします。今回の特別ウェビナーでは UC サンディエゴキャンパスリードを務めるマイケル・キルソン教授がカリフォルニア大学の研究者にチキンと指導を提供し未解決の医療ニーズに応える医薬品の開発を推進するというコンソーシアムの使命をご説明いただき企業メンバーとの連携確立の重要性を論じます UCDDC の概要説明に続き UCLA、UC リバーサイド、UC バークレーのキャンパスリードを務める教授らが最近の創薬関連研究の事例紹介を行い、皆様からのご質問にもお答えいたします。ぜひお申し込みの方よろしくお願いします。また、今後お聞きになりたいテーマや登壇者についてご意見、ご要望いただきたく、QR コードもしくはウェビナー終了後に表示されるリンクよりアンケートフォームへお進みいただき、皆様のご意見、感想をお聞かせください。皆様のお役に立つセミナーを開催したく、ご協力をよろしくお願いいたします。また、リンク J のイベントお知らせメールを受け取りたい方は、表示されております QR コードからご登録ください。その他のお問い合わせなどは、リンク J ホームページよりご投稿いただけます。それでは皆様、本日はご視聴いただきまして、ありがとうございました。<音楽>